Have you ever had someone believe in you and see something in you that others maybe didn't? Have you ever had someone do something special for you and it made you want to contribute and do something for someone else? Today's guest will share with you some real-life obstacles and struggles and how she overcame them. Corina Bellissi is the host of the Care More, Be Better podcast and focuses on social impact and sustainability. Corina has also been a very successful executive in the natural products industry for years. Let's dive into the episode. How do entrepreneurs, business owners, and experts influence themselves, their clients, and teams to maximize profitability, efficiency, and create lasting impact? How do they simplify life and business and yet still achieve more? What's the one thing separating the mediocre from the best? This podcast will give you the answers and reveal the secret strengths and the not-so-easy-to-admit flaws of the elite. My name is Satori Matteo, and welcome to the half ass to Badass Podcast. Welcome to the show, Karina. First of all, today, uh, it's going to be an amazing conversation. I know it. Um, I usually start our interviews with one question, and because I, I always love to hear the perspective. So in your perspective, what is the difference between a half-ass and a badass? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I love that you made me laugh to start it. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would never want to consider themselves a half ass, right? You you just think automatically, oh, right, I'm a badass. Of course, I'm a badass, right? I think a half ass is somebody who isn't really engaged with their life fully. They're just kind of going along with the everyday, punching into their job and watching the clock. Mm. And that could be, you know, somebody at their work or it could even be at home, but it's just <clears throat> they're watching the time go by without really being part of it, if that makes sense. Mm. And I think a badass is someone who says, what can I accomplish today and what can I do? Mm. Um, so if you're coming at a perspective from, you know, what can I contribute and what can I do to lead a great life, then you're automatically already a badass. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> I think that's great. And I think I know that you've done a lot of badass things in your life and you're still and you're doing it right now. So I, I always want to understand uh, people's perspectives and people's uh, trajectory because they, they take so many different forms and shapes and you have your journey, your life journey, and you have had so many different experiences in your life that kind of created and shaped who you are today. And um, I'd love to know, how did Karina become Karina? Like, what is your backstory? Oh, wow. Okay, so um, I could go back to being born at home in Ashland, Oregon to hippie parents. I do mm -hmm. think that um, that very beginning, it does affect where you end up, right? Both of my parents are, you know, really liberal people who want to do good with their lives. They care a lot about the state of the world, the environment, mm. and they care a lot about family. And mm. so for me at an early age, what that meant is that I had a lot of love around me and I was intentionally birthed at home and delivered, you know, into the world in the early AM hours, you know, an entry into the world in which I experienced a lot of love. I experienced parents who cared a lot about me and who were working to to build a better future for themselves and their family and doing so mindfully. And I think that that ingrained in me at an early age a perspective of wanting to do good and wanting to be mindful, of wanting to be connected to the environment, to people and animals around me. And so, you know, that led to me studying anthropology and wanting to understand people more it then led to me going and working in the natural products industry, trying to build companies that would sell responsible products that help people live a healthier life. So these things are connected, right? Like you can draw a through line from one to the other, but they're not necessarily a linear path, right? Like anthropology to business isn't necessarily always like a direct route. Right. Um, but I think there is a commonality. There's a thread there. Yes, and I, I, we'll, we'll get into it deeper in, in just a moment because I know that you have you have a very interesting uh, story around that. Um, 
So if you think about these the these snapshots of your life, you know, it, growing up where you grew up and and having the family you had and everything, what is like one moment that you, in your life that you feel like impacted you strongly, that kind of shifted the trajectory of your life, and that wouldn't have happened unless this happened? Like what is what what shifted for you? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? I had a really rough time in fourth grade. (laughs) So, um, you know, thinking back, I think that my mind is going to this more frequently now that I have school aged children that are in school and tackling the obstacles that are in front of them. When I was in fourth grade, I had a professor that treated our coursework as if it was a militaristic event. And we had homework for every subject every single day. And projects that were quite in depth. I struggled to get them done on time constantly and spent most of my hours in the evenings doing studies in order to succeed. Mm. It meant that at the same time, I didn't have as much time to play the piano or play with my friends or do any of the other extracurricular things that would be required of you. And it ultimately started to get me to disengage from study. And I loved being in school before that point. So something happened in fifth grade. You know, I basically just barely passed fourth grade because of this insane classwork with this insane professor. I mean, Mm. I do not say that lightly. A lot of students in that class struggled. Mm. I go into fifth grade and I had this teacher, Mr. Roberts, and he saw in me the struggle and he also saw in me the light. And Mm. he said to me, you know, I I can see you really like the sciences. You know, there's a science camp happening this summer. And I want to go ahead and make sure you're able to get into it. Well, we couldn't afford the fee, so he paid it. And this simple act by this person, I mean, he might have spent a couple hundred dollars. I don't remember what it was. I mean, this is years and years ago, right? This simple act by him re-engaged me in scholastic pursuits. It changed my sense that people really genuinely would help one another without necessarily having something in it for them. Mm. And I think that that instilled a sense of altruism in me at a very, very young age. Since that point in time, I've always, you know, worked to give back to other uh, children that are having a little bit of a struggle making their own ends meet so that they could do things like be part of that summer science camp. Um, And to me, I think that was a shift point in my perception of how people could collaborate and be with one another. Mm, nice. Nice. That's interesting. I, I, and it's, it's those moments that shifts perspectives that changes people's focus and, and makes us create different habits. And then all of a sudden just become natural parts of our, of our being. And we just don't think about it. And, and unless we stop for a moment and think about it, like we just did right now. So appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that. I know you have an interesting story around the company that you told me the other day a little bit about the, uh, the company. And, uh, you know, you talked about the Nordic, uh, what's it called Nordic? Nordic Naturals, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking about that. And, and I'd love to know and more about, and not so much that, that, I mean, the numbers in of itself, of course, is impressive. But, but what I think is even more interesting and inspiring it's to understand what are those little nuances that again that goes takes someone from being a half-ass to being a badass like what are those distinctions and so i'd I'll, I'll love to know share a little bit about, about the story like you know the company how you started it where, where it was when you started it, and where you took it from and to uh, and then we'll continue because i want to know or maybe you you know right away, but what were those distinctions? What were those thought patterns that you believe shifted it? What made you produce such results? And why hadn't they done that before you? Like mm-hmm. what shifted? Yeah, I mean, there, there are some external as well as internal things, but I will first start with how I discovered the company. And I think it will give some light to where they were at the time that I worked with them. And so 
I'd gone to Natural Products Expo West every year since 99 when I joined the in industry selling herbal extracts for a um, herbal extract manufacturer. Mm. And so I would go there. I would look for new clients potentially to collaborate with to create really great formulas that we would then market to the end consumer, right? So mm. I always looked at um, going to this show, which is like Disneyland for adults to me, especially for those with hippie naturalistic roots, right? Like, oh, natural food, supplements. It's, it's like the Mecca for that, really. And right. so I'd wandered the aisles and I was just wanting to be thorough in my pursuit. So I went to this section of the trade show floor that was, you know, less trafficked and had a lot of newcomers. And I discovered Nordic Naturals. There was this woman, Bonnie Johnson, standing in the booth. And she's very prim, um, wearing like all kind of grayish tones, um, kind of subdued, right? Um, and very kind of Scandinavian in this look. Um, there's a booth that's just a simple tabletop. And this um, three and a half year old girl named Maria is pictured holding this giant codfish um, it, on display to you right mm. like the fish probably outweighs her <laughs> and <laughs> and so i i'm like wow that just stopped me in my tracks and then bonnie is telling me all about these fruit flavored soft gels and i should you know try them and chew on them and i'm looking at her like she's crazy because <laughs> i was a competition mountain biker in my youth and I'd taken a lot of fish oils and they always made me fishy burp. I mean, I would, I took enough of it that I would literally sweat it out. Like my Jersey after an intense ride would literally smell like stinky fish. Yes. And so I didn't have the most pleasant experience with it. Right? Um, right. And I'm like, I'm looking at her like she's crazy. I take a soft gel, I bite it and wow, it's not unpleasant. It tastes like strawberry bubble gum, if I'm being clear, you know, and mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, this can be done. So now I'm still thinking about it from a perspective of this could be a potential customer formulas with herbal extracts or whatever, right? right. So I kept her card and moved on. And I had reached out, didn't happen. Nobody got back to me until I saw a job listing for a national sales manager for this very company. And I thought, oh. huh, I could do that job. I'm doing that job for someone else right now. Huh, <laughs> you know, the FDA... In February that year had just passed um, a disclaimer, you could say, uh, you know, substantive but non substantive but non conclusive evidence exists to support the omega three fish oils can benefit heart health, right? Like EPA and DHA from omega threes. Yes. Uh -huh. Really long thing, but it's meaningful because it means now the FDA supports this as a nutrient, right? Like. This is going to be a growth opportunity for anybody who's in this space, and so I thought okay, I could make this something. This this disruptive fruit-flavored soft gel that the company has a patent on could be leveraged if I can get it in front of enough people. Mm. And that second piece, if I can get it in front of enough people, because you really have to get people to try it and experience it in order for them to understand it doesn't have to be that stinky jersey, stinky burpy, unpleasant experience. So. Right. I worked with the CEO to create kind of a, a demonstration platform where we would just funnel most of our marketing dollars into efforts that would get us in front of consumers and give them the opportunity to experience it the same way I had, dispel my disbelief and gain buy-in because the science is there and because it doesn't have to smell like a rotting fish. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. So, so for me, that was that was the big journey, right? Like distilling it down to something simple that a consumer who doesn't know much about omega-3s could experience, understand, grab hold of. Um, and then essentially from there, building out that demonstration campaign, figuring out where we we're going to advertise, developing partnership with retailers, and funneling a lot of our resources to cooperative advertising so we could gain more buy-in from the retailer so we could get better shelf space and, and, and it just all kind of created this flywheel principle where everyone was working for us and we could ultimately create a brand that would stand the test of time <laughs> and it has, um, mm. you know, and reach more consumers and benefit their health. Mm. Nice. So then you, 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 you switched 
and, and you you start to care more, be better, right? Your podcast. And I love to know the story behind that because you know your podcast not, not only you know does it help and inspire other people to care more and be better, but it also helped you. Um, tell me more about that. How did it help you? Well, I think it's a journey. Um, I ended up leaving Nordic Naturals uh, just about 10 years ago um, after mm -hmm. I had accomplished everything that I planned to accomplish while I was there. I mean, that was a thing. When I started the job, I said I was willing to dedicate the next five to seven years of my life. I ended up staying nine and mm. I was going to accomplish this, this, this and that. Right. <laughs> and the last yeah. big one, the thing I would hope to accomplish, the thing I wanted to do was to create a sales and education conference that brought together all the doctors and all of our brokers, everybody to one spot and really work to inspire them and create content that would matter, right? Yeah. That would get them fired up. And the reason that this is important, even though it's 10 years ago and it took me until this year to start this podcast is because it was all about kind of creating that story and that content together, yeah. doing so in a meaningful way and in a format that would really fire people up. So I did that. And we got it into the world. And instead of our brokers feeling all drained by the time they ended up to Expo West and having this really intense time and then being at a big trade show that was a lot, a lot of work, they went in and were soaring high on everything that we created together, right? And so on the, on the tail end of that, I came back from the show and I was just having a really hard time remaining engaged because I literally checked all the boxes, everything I planned to do at this company before I left. Yeah. And so I made the really difficult decision to leave it behind. I yeah. left the company. I've since worked as a contractor and helped to develop some really incredible brands. Um, some of that is behind the scenes and not for public disclosure, but you know, it's been an incredible ability. I've just had the gift of being able to be a part of some incredible projects. Yes. And the one thing I always wanted to do was to consistently create impact and develop products that were more sustainable. I've done that through my work life, but this mm. last year I was really making the choice. I said, I want to double down. I want to utilize all the skills that I've developed through course and content creation to, you know, being a show on, um, being a guest on radio shows to being a guest on now a lot of podcasts too, mm -hmm. and put more good into the world, create a show that was really exclusively about social impact and sustainability to double down on all of those kind of not for profit, um, fire in the belly efforts that I've always wanted to get out into the world, but mm -hmm. not be limited to just one subject like fish oils, or not be limited to just one cause like saving the sea turtle, as a, mm. for example, it could, it could kind of go across all of these things, cover my many interests, enable me to have really meaningful conversations with people that are putting more good into the world to reach a global audience and inspire them to act, inspire them to engage, inspire them to be just a more complete and whole citizen of the world. So that's really it. And I feel like there is a direct line from that sales and education conference I hosted back in 2011 wow. to my departing and now this 10 years later. Mm. So it, is, it sounds like, uh, like we talked about earlier, it's like, it's like you, you're living in alignment with your highest values. Yeah, I mean, that is the goal, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, I just interviewed you on my podcast and I'm, I took furious notes while we were talking, but I felt like um, really for the first time for me that a leader was providing the blueprint that I may have somewhat inadvertently been following just by instinct over the years, but mm. like literally everything you shared rang so true that I am just like, I need to apply this to my life and reapply and, and work on the evolution, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So with, with that in mind, I'm curious to know what gives you energy? What, what, what provides you with inspiration? What inspires you and what gives you energy? Well, really what gives me energy and inspires me is knowing that I'm putting more good into the world in any capacity, really, from the small things like you know, getting the smallest garbage can from our local waste recovery and not even filling it halfway with a family of four, Mm -hmm. to, 
you know, installing rain barrels to capture water and water my garden and then seeing the fruit bear and my own fruit trees. I mean, those are the microcosms within my own home. That brings me joy. Mm. It's the small things that I'm doing that I can see produce measurable results that, I mean, I'm making less of an impact on the environment or I'm making a positive impact on the environment. I've acknowledged that I'm mostly, I'm mostly feeding my squirrels (laughs) (laughs) because they get to the tree fruit before I I get to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's also part of being a part of the local ecosystem. And, um, you know, they have as much right to live and breathe as I do. So that's okay. Um, But then it also comes from, you know, really working on bigger initiatives too. Like I've been interviewing a lot of people and I don't say a lot, but a few from West Africa who are working to make a difference in countries there and ultimately support equal rights for all people, um, regardless of your race, creed, um, sexual preference, whatever that might be, Mm. and identity, right? So um, I get fired up about these things. I find that I have more spring in my step since I started the podcast. Mm. I do talk about this on an earlier episode, too, um, when I connected with uh, Chris Roberts of the North Wales Dragons. It's a not-for-profit soccer club, Mm. uh, football, you know, for Europeans out there. (laughs) Um, Uh But he and I talked about the fact that during this time of COVID, you know, we'd been on kind of this slippery slope of depression because all of a sudden your, you know, bathroom is also your latrine, your kitchen is also your cafeteria, et cetera, et cetera. And your, your world got smaller to within the four walls that you live within for many, many people. That was a reality and for extended periods. And so this lack of connection with other people really made us kind of struggle. And I didn't realize that I was also depressed at the time that I started this podcast. And so Mm. when I did, it was a very sudden, almost immediate change in my energy levels and how good I felt about myself because I I had um, now I was connecting with people in a meaningful way. I was putting something into the world that I felt really good about Even if, you know, I said, um, too many times on that podcast or something, uh, foolish in one phrase. I mean, I, nobody's perfect. Right. So that reality for me has helped me to remain focused on the show and trying to produce better shows. (laughs) Um, but I also have to put out there that, I mean, so far, this is really just kind of my way to give back into the world. I haven't monetized it. I still work in my the natural channel, um, working in supplements and developing brands. And I am enjoying that work. I feel like it's feeding me because I'm putting this good out in the world and it's feeding my soul. So I feel more energized. I'm, I'm more creative. I'm bringing stronger ideas to my work. And so it, I've just found it to be incredibly fulfilling. It's interesting you say that because that is actually what's what when you're speaking right now, I can hear um, I can hear how it's all tying into your values, right? Everything that you love talking about, everything that you love focusing on, that, and that's what you're saying. Like it makes you more focused, it brings you more energy. Like it's it's your you're completely in sync with your values, and that's what provides the inspiration provides the energy, provides the focus, because wherever we have value is where our focus goes. So the more we we are connected to our values and are are in alignment with our values, the the less external motivation is needed. And you have that interest you have internal inspiration, which brings focus, just like a kid that can play, you know, you know, video game or, you know, computer game, they can... If you think about being challenged and all those challenges take you to the next level. And mm-hmm. once you pass that level, it takes you to the next level. And, and those are inspiring challenges you, that just keeps you wanting to go further and deeper and more, right? And so it's a challenge that, that, that you want rather than a challenge that you don't want. So it's, it's fascinating to hear because it, it it provides that the focus, that energy, that that uh, that place where you are building energy rather than depleting depleting energy. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean it makes perfect sense. One of the things it's just kept me kind of 
rolling more. I, I'm now producing sometimes up to two podcasts a week, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm talking to some really inspiring people like yourself and it keeps me again, motivated to, to drive forward another day. And, um, and I just, I think it's meaningful. Yes. And if you think about that, actually looking at our, our success path or deliberate uh, journey that we talked about, it's like looking at what, what do you do to gain clarity? What gives you clarity? doing this work that you're doing with the podcast, everything you're doing, what, what gives you clarity? Well, I ask myself a few questions as I was leaving Nordic Naturals a few years ago, right? Because um, my, my identity had become so wrapped up in the company that mm. there wasn't a lot of separation between myself and them. Mm. And so that had gotten to a bit of an unhealthy space, right? Like I, I you know, was lovingly referred to by some people at a customer of the vitamin shop as Mrs. Nordic Naturals. <laughs> and it was a little bit too on the nose for me. That was one of those things where I started to evaluate and go, okay, like, yeah, the separation isn't really there. I work long hours. I get up early. I'm working into the night and on the weekends and, 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 right. Mm. Um, which is often what it takes to pioneer a brand. Like when you're really building a startup, I mean, you're all in, right? Yes. But the company's values, while they were similar to my own, were not my own. And that was mm. a question I had to first answer, right? So mm. what is important to me? Um, what's important to me? Okay, uh, community. What else is important to me? Knowing that I'm doing good. You know, kind mm. of going back through kind of a list of what I felt really resonated in my core. And I could get a sense when I asked myself these questions of how true or some true or not something was, because I think sometimes we get in the habit of telling ourselves what we think we should do mm. or what we think um, others would want us to do without it really being our own, mm. um, you know, living up to your parents' expectations, whatever they yeah. might be, you know, yeah. living up to the expectations of your partner, whatever those might be of your sister, of your, you know, all of your relationships ultimately start to kind of cloud that somewhat. Right. And so I was never a big meditator. I was never, I, I have a hard time quieting the mind as it is. And so I just really would go on kind of long walks by myself, get out by the ocean. I found that to be kind of cleansing and, and ask myself these questions like what matters most? What do I care most about? And mm. what do I want to do next? I also mm. threw myself into working with animals because I felt like, working with animals, I could get more clear, I, almost through the meditative work of washing down a horse, or um, going out a long trail ride. And um, what I consistently and persistently came back to was reduction of my impact on the environment, putting more good in the world, caring about my common man, wanting to ensure that everybody had equal access to basic human rights. And so those have kind of led me and guided me as I continued my pursuits, both in business and in work. And so mm. when I decided to start this podcast, as a, for example, the Care More, Be Better podcast, I was really looking at it as me sticking a stake in the sand yes, and saying, this is what I stand for. And mm. I'm willing to say that publicly. I'm yes. willing to say it professionally and in my personal life. And mm. I don't care who knows it. Like, it's not something I feel like I have to guard um, mm. because it rings true because I personally think it's something to be proud of, to to care about your common man and to want to have a healthy planet. I mean, <laughs> yes. I think these are things everybody should want. And so... Um, Oh, there I go with the should, though. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I'm but proud enough, enough of it to stick my claim. Because we, we, uh, uh, we, we have strong values, and, and sometimes, you know, it's so easy to, like, you know, we want to project those or inject those values into other people. Uh, but we, we do need to take a stand, because when we do take a stand, uh, we magnetize people towards us, just as we repel all the people, right? Yeah. So. Both is going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I'm curious to know, uh, going up the, the faces here, 
So you, that gives you clarity. You ask, you ask all those great questions, like what's important to me? What matters to me? What do I really want? Like all these questions, awesome questions. Um, what did you have to eliminate? What did you have to say no to? I always talk about that. When you say no to something, you say, say yes to something else. You make something else possible. Mm -hmm. That when you say yes to something, you say no to something. So you're always saying yes or no to something and something is going to come to your life or something's going to be eliminated. So what did you, what did you eliminate? What did you say no to in order to, to create the space for you to have this podcast and, and, and build the brand that you're building right now and everything that you're creating? What did you have to eliminate from your life? Well, I, I think Internal of it as... Or external. Yeah, I think it is. I I think of it more as additive. I, I, I try to keep a positive headset on in just about everything I pursue. Mm -hmm. But if I was to choose the things I eliminated, I eliminated the possibility of going to work for companies that don't care about social impact and sustainability. Mm. So I, I eliminated a possible future, at least in my mind. Mm. So like if, for instance, uh, RJ Reynolds was to come to me and say, come work for us. And, you know, what do they do? They sell tobacco and other products. The answer would be no. Right. right. Regardless of, you know, what I might otherwise want to do from a fiscal perspective. Right. Like if they came with a huge offer that was like something would be difficult to say no to for a lot of people, it would be a simple no for me. And for me, that just provides further clarity. I've automatically said no to something that I wouldn't have already wanted anyway. Um, another thing I have said no to is uh, really, I think, working full time in an office um, at a headquarters uh, that's located somewhere else. Yeah. So, so when you say no to things, you say yes to something else. So you're literally saying no to and not working with companies that don't stand for the things that you stand for. Which meant you said yes to what? I said yes to making a choice to work for companies that are really rooted in values of doing good. Mm. And so I think that um, ultimately will dictate where I go from here in a professional scope. Um, I'm not likely again to work for a tobacco company or somebody who sells vodka to the masses. I mean, these are things that I don't necessarily say, oh, that's awful or terrible. I mean, heck, if people want to drink alcohol, they can. If they want to smoke, they can. But I don't think those companies are necessarily out there to do good. They're out there to sell vices to people who become dependent on them in many cases. Right. So, right. you know, that's my limit. It's kind of like a limit, a line in the sand that I've drawn. Um, right. I also said no to really um, taking on uh, stories or guests that don't resonate with the ethos of the show. Mm. And what that does for me is focuses my efforts in networking. And so if you think about that, it's like, um, you know, I could choose to spend a lot of hours on LinkedIn or Clubhouse or any other number of social networks to connect with all sorts of people. And I might be enticed by um, their particular charisma or their following, but I'm, I'm saying no to featuring them on the show because it doesn't make sense with the ethos of it. Mm. So I've kind of honed in on a brand for, for me and a personal and professional scope in a way with the mm. podcast. Mm. Um, I am also saying no to doing things that feel like time wastes because this does take more time um, than just the time you spend in recording. There is the networking, there is the um, effort of editing. If you're doing the editing yourself, I do edit some of the shows myself and I send others away for processing depending on my work schedule, really. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm really kind of just refining where I spend my professional time and effort. Yes. So it's enabled me Love to get that. really focused. Yeah, it's interesting when you say that because that kind of brings back the, the mental capacity Right, because when you say you know the, these things and you eliminate things, you actually create more space for you to be able to put the energy and the, the focus and the things that matter to you in mm -hmm. front of you, and it gives that you, you give more life to the things that actually are important to you, rather than the things that are not important. So it, it's I, I love that because I think today there there's so many entrepreneurs in the world and people that want to create a business, but they can't get over that hump or they that that extra effort that it takes. But I think that part of it is because there's 
putting so much effort and thinking of things that they actually don't need to focus on. Like you have your expertise, you have your knowledge, your skill set, and you've created the brand that you want to create and you're building it, but you're not putting your focus on things that, that just takes a lot of uh, time and, 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 and drains your energy. And you put focus on the things that actually gives you energy. So I think that's, that's very important. So what is one thing that, a, a one thing or, or a habit um, that you see makes you productive, that, that produces energy for you? What is a habit that you have that creates structure in your business? Hmm. Well, one is that I really try to use my calendar and um, thankfully my professional email is also a Google calendar. So I sync all of them across for, you know, minimized effort across all platforms for my personal to provide for, to my professional. And nice. um, that enables me to really keep an eye on what's expected. Um, I have some basic habits of trying to wrap up each day with a few notes to myself um, where I just jot down a couple of things that I accomplished that day and keep an eye on what I have planned ahead for the, the rest of the week. And I say the rest of the week often because, you know, I really try to not schedule so much into a single day um, mm. so that I can have more focused time and planning. And if I need to have an ad hoc meeting related to work, I can fit that in. So mm. I, I really create a flexible schedule for every afternoon because that way in the afternoon hours when I'm feeling more creative, I can kind of go where it takes me. And mm. at the same time, on the tail end of that, I can wrap up what I felt like I'd accomplished and the things I have ahead for the rest of the week. And I think those practices help me to remain focused and also keep my eye on the prize because when I am kind of checking off boxes and saying what I've accomplished, I find that gives me a little fuel for my fire too, because I, I, I like to accomplish things. I, I'm kind of a producer that way. Yes. Beautiful. And, and uh, I'm sure that goes hand in hand in some way, but I, I'd like to know how do you balance? I mean, I think that so many people, they live in a, in a, in a whirlwind of having so many spinning plates at the same time and they you know i have to do this i have to do that and i have so much to do and i think that a lot of times people use that as a way to feel significant to feel important you know feeling stress is like a hip thing sometimes but but if you think about the way that you structure your day the way you uh, live your life how do how do you balance life and business so this is a struggle for me, I'll admit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tend to fill my time no matter what my schedule looks like, right? So even if it is just, oh, I'm spending creative time now, I will tend to fill that. And so one of the things that I'm implementing as a practice, um, this is something that John LaFaver counseled me to do in our episode together when I interviewed him a few weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. was just schedule a 30 minutes a day to do nothing. Mm. And he really just says, do nothing like, no, don't sit there and try to meditate. Don't sit there <laughs> and uh, write down your to do list, literally, just do nothing, just sit and be at peace for 30 minutes. And so for me, that is a challenge like that's hard. It's also yeah. probably the reason it's hard for me to do uh, what I would call a traditional meditative practice. I tend to resonate more with kind of a flow meditation where like while you're washing the dishes or you're running or, or, or like there's always something that goes along with it. Yes. yes. But I've noticed that when I do just sit and I'm doing this outside on my deck typically now because it's um, you can hear the birds tweeting and there's not a lot of distraction and I could be out in the sun or just under the awning. So I have I can moderate my temperature a little bit. Right. I find it very freeing. It's um, giving me a different sort of energy and it does feel like it's feeding me in a way that I wasn't paying attention to before. Yes. So that is my most recent um, endeavor to, to head towards more of a balance. The other thing is that I'm just trying to be less connected to all of my devices when I spend time with my children. 
Mm. So just being in the moment with them where they have my attention and they're not saying, mommy, uh, you know, put your phone down because like my six year old literally would tell me that. And so it's in my purse. It's not on my person. And I am engaged with my child and experiencing life a little bit more through his eyes. Mm. So I think yeah. that's, um, that's as close as I can get now. That's what I'm working on. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. That, that's awesome. And I think that's a, it's something that w- we, um, as, as entrepreneurs, as people want to create and do great things and achieve a lot, uh, it, it can be hard and, and tough to, to say no to things and be able to say yes to yourself sometimes to just be, um, and, and if you don't put it in, in your calendar or if you don't make it priority, you know, you, you, something's going to be taking priority. Um, and I realized that um, even recently, I, I, you know, we, we live, obviously, we have beautiful mountains and we have beautiful sea and uh, all mixed together. And so mm-hmm. walking down and just getting into the water right now, every day, getting in, in salt water and just letting yourself float and just be there and just looking at the sunset and just staying in the water until the sun wow. like a huge you know gold fire like going into the ocean uh, is amazing and and wow. so to just breathe and feel the water and just feel your body relaxing it's you know it, yeah it, it it requires a little bit of of, of focus to actually let go Mm-hmm. And actually give yourself that time to relax and just be. Yeah. But and and it's not easy for everybody. <laughs> no, no, it, it, for sure. For sure. I agree. Totally. Okay. So before we wrap out, I just want to ask you people that want to know more about, about you and what you do and, and, and where you're heading and um, how can people get to know more of you and, and how, how you do it? So <clears throat> yeah, I, I would just counsel them to check out my website, which is caremorebebetter.com. There I post blogs, um, all of my episodes. I also have an action page that helps people figure out what they can do to make a difference as it relates to the topics I cover on my show. There isn't one each week, but you know, generally every month it's updated. Um, I also wanted to leave your audience with a bit of a gift if they ever suffer from a busy brain and insomnia. So this is just something that came to me as we were talking a moment ago. So if I can backtrack for a sec. Yes. Go ahead. Great, great. So um, I used to suffer from insomnia and this was bad during the throes of busy work, especially when I was putting in those 80 hour weeks at Nordic Naturals. Um, I worked alongside this incredible woman, Alex Pallison, and she'd also battled that same thing. We were building the business together, essentially her on the operations side and me on sales and marketing. Right. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, Karina, just remember to tell yourself when you wake up with that busy brain, or if you're having a difficulty getting to sleep, this is me time. Mm -hmm. And that mantra is what has helped me in that half hour space that I'm taking during the day now too. This is me time. And Mm. so if I can just divorce all of the other noise that's kind of trying to come in and infiltrate my space and um, Sally, whatever I'm trying to accomplish at that moment, whether it be going to sleep or getting clear or focusing on a new project or whatever, just to say, this is me time. Mm. Nice. Nice. Very important. Uh, and I know it's not always easy, but if you're listening to this right now or watching it, you know, take the time and, and allow yourself to be present with what matters to you most. And, you know, me time is very important. Actually, until you say with insomnia, I, I am, um, there was a doctor that I, I read this book a long time ago, but I, I remember I, when I started to understand the different sections of the different parts of the brain and how they function well, one thing that i realized is that when you think about a memory uh, it doesn't have to be but in nature like if you're walking in nature a, a a memory that you have from nature that you that you feel inspired by or that you enjoyed and you think when you lay down in bed you just lay down and you breathe relax and you think about this memory uh, and you see this little movie little mini movie of 
this moment. And you picture that when you think of it as a memory, I think this is really interesting because the forefront of your brain, uh, the executive part of the brain, it's the one that, that makes decisions and try to do things and solve problems and everything, mm -hmm. right? So when you think about your executive part of your brain, when you think of a memory, so anything that, anything that is not from today, anything that's like 24 hours old, uh, then it activates a different part of your brain. Mm. So, because it can go both, go both ways, right? You can lay in bed and be excited and inspired about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then your brain wakes up and you start thinking about this and that, and you start to solve problems. And you're like you're, you're solving things and you're excited about it. So it can be a positive experience, but it still wakes you up. <laughs> yeah. Right? It doesn't make you want to go to sleep. Or you may be in your head uh, worrying about things or, or being in fear mode, thinking about things that you have to solve that, that, that feels bad to you, for you. And you start, and you're still activating that part of your brain. But when you think about something that you feel grateful for, a walk in nature, a moment, and you see that movie, that image, and you, you, can, you can use the same movie every night. And I realized, because I had the same problem, the moment I started focusing on that movie, and I saw that picture, I, usually it was like, I used to live in Malibu. And I used to see this glitter from the beach. I mean, on, on the, from the ocean onto the beach and see the water and, and, the, and the afternoon glitter, the kind of diamonds on the water. And I used to picture walking there and seeing that. And I gotta tell you, like, I didn't have to think about more than 10 seconds and I was gone. Mm -hmm. And I, I was asleep. But in the past, I would I could have I could lay in bed for like three, four, five, six hours, and my brain was just working hard. <laughs> so it was an interesting thing to like realize, like thinking about a memory, the, the pleasant memory from the past, mm -hmm. it activates a completely different part of your brain, and your executive center goes to rest. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really great tip. Another thing I do, if I'm having particular time, difficult time getting to sleep is I start to play a soundtrack in my mind of some of my favorite and more relaxing songs. Mm. And I, it's literally like I can hear it. It's just kind of playing through. And even if I'm having trouble sleeping, I can enter this kind of almost a trance state where I feel like I'm getting rest, mm. but I'm not completely asleep. And yeah. then that'll often kind of drift into my dreams once I am asleep. So not an unpleasant mm. thing, but it's just another tool to help, um, at least me, get into that restful state. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. I appreciate you being here with us and, and sharing the your story, sharing your experiences and your insights about life, about business and how you see the world. Um, I'd love to know one last thing. Um if you had to like leave everything behind you, hmm. like anything, anything that you own, and all you were left with was your knowledge, your skills, you got to keep all that stuff. Mm -hmm. How would you do things if you had to start from scratch? Hmm. How would I do things? How would I? Um, if you were I'm, to start I'm, your business, if you if you were to start a business oh. right, right now, right with nothing, mm -hmm. with nothing. Well, literally you had nothing, but you did have your skills, your intelligence, mm -hmm. your perceptions. What would you do? Well, I imagine I would still have access to things like a notepad and a pen and yes. um, maybe a computer and uh, especially in this digital age. Um, so I think I would get to the hard work of writing out what my values are and figuring out what would be important enough to me to put my next foot forward again. Mm. Um, I imagine that I would land in somewhat of a similar spot. But it's something I've actually thought a bit about because I just completed my MBA from Santa Clara University, and that was two hard years. Uh, many mm -hmm. people have asked me, you know, what I plan to do with it or what I plan to do differently. Mm -hmm. And the reality for me has been, you know, I feel like I'm just here to do more of the same. I just now have more tools in my tool shed with which to do the work that I, I plan to kind of head forth on. 
Um, I think the primary thing I would do differently, if there is one thing I would do differently, um, is I would focus more on developing connections with the people I admire and seeking to work with them. And that may change a bit the industry I choose to be in. Um, mm. So it's a big question that I've been asking myself. You know, I've worked for 20 plus years in the natural products industry, and it's really hard to consider leaving it behind because so many of my skills are entrenched uh, with all these people I've developed connections with over the years. Mm. And so I think if I was starting fresh, completely fresh, like without let's say these connections that were also holding me that yeah. I, I might end up in a different industry. Mm, so that's, that's kind of the big question. Like, would it be in technology? Maybe. I mean, maybe, I guess. Um, mm. Would it be working um, in entertainment? Possibly maybe screenwriting. I, I don't know. Like that's the, the big thing that I haven't been able to get hundred percent clear with because um, divorcing my experience from the connections I have doesn't seem as easy as I might have thought it once was. Mm, interesting. Yes, I completely get what you're saying. That's very interesting. Well, maybe at some point, uh, and hopefully sooner than later, uh, we'll, we'll do an episode here in Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would love that. So yeah. yes, definitely stay in touch because I want to see what it is that you're doing there. And um, perhaps I could even bring my my new like special device here, my Zoom Podrack P4 with me and yes. record episodes live with you there too. So. That'd be awesome. All we're looking to see, <laughs> the Mediterranean Sea. Floating in the ocean. Maybe, yes. maybe not. The electronic devices don't love that as much. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, beautiful. It was great having you on the show and uh, I can't wait to see and hear what you're doing more and um, let's talk soon. Oh, thank you. I look forward to it. Boom! How did you like that? Hey, if you're thinking, I want some more hands-on training, I wish I had someone who could keep me accountable, keep my mindset straight and help me grow. And if you want to be part of a community of badasses just like yourself, you can go to halfassedobadass.com and join the waitlist because we are in the middle of creating something super cool. And if you're liking this experience, the community we're building will blow your mind for sure. We haven't officially opened the doors yet, but by getting your name on the VIP list, you will be the first to know when we go live. Sound exciting? We are very excited. Actually, the more accurate word would be inspired. I can't wait to share this with you. So it's super easy. Just go to halfassedbadass.com and get yourself on the VIP list right now. Talk soon.